Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Um, right. I, well, I was actually going to start by saying I welcome questions um, uh, and comments during the, the talk, but uh, I don't know if that's actually allowed. We can do that if you want. I presume the reason is because uh, you can't hear the questions on, on the video. Is that it? I'll, I'm happy to repeat them. If, if that wants to raise their hand at any time, we can or just interrupt. Yeah, yeah. like that, that's fine. I'm, I'll repeat the question. Um, so yeah, this is. So I'm not an absolute expert in all the tools and libraries that I'm going to present or talk about. I've used some of them, uh, and some of them I used a while back. So last year, for example, so the API, APIs might have changed, um, and also I haven't used some of some of the other ones. So if you have uh, an opinion that differs to what I'm saying, I'm more than happy to, to hear what you have to say. I, as I said, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, I've used some of, uh, some of these tools only. Um, and what else? This should be fairly uh, shallow look at some of the transformation tools. I don't want to go into too much detail because it could be a, a bit too much. Um, hopefully it'll generate some ideas or interest in this about me really quickly, that's my Twitter handle. If you want to follow me, I just tweet stuff about uh, JavaScript and React usually most of the time. The two repos, you probably ignore them actually for the most part because they're very specific to the use case that I created for my company, the tool that I created for my company. So they might not be, they're not very generic, but um, some of the code snippets in the talk come from, from that, those two repos. So before I start talking about um, transforming code, I have to explain like why did we want to do this in my company. Um, I work for a company called Kaplan Systems. They're based in London. I'm actually working remotely for them. So you probably don't know them. They build um, trading applications, online trading applications, foreign exchange. I don't know if actually the web works. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a demo there, but uh, no internet. Uh, basically foreign exchange, equity, stocks, all, all the usual stuff, um, real-time trading. So th these are quite large and complex, and we started doing this a long time ago, um, before really people knew how to do it. In fact, sometimes we struggled to sell because banks didn't believe you could do this in JavaScript. Uh, they thought we were mad. Um, there was no such thing as AMD, CommonJS, or E6 modules. There was just no way to encapsulate code and to specify, uh, to specify dependencies. Um, and prototype JS was the big thing back then. So it was a long, long time ago. Um, so, you know, we didn't know, could we actually build applications of this size, about like 250,000 lines of code, more, uh, thousands of classes? We weren't certain if it could be done. So, you know, we, we looked around and, and, see, and, and looked at what else worked right now at that time, which was um, Java front end. So quite often traders would trade with heavy Java client desktop apps and they worked perfectly fine. So we looked at them and we copied what they did, which meant that our code uh, was written like this. Now, if you can't see the code at the very far back, uh, just imagine the worst possible uh, code style in the universe, and that's it. Uh, it's extremely verbose, uh, not flexible, um, but it allowed us to separate our code from our client's code, because we would build these applications and deliver them to the clients, but they'd want their own workflows and their own uh, features added to them. So because back then everything was in the global namespace, we couldn't afford to have classes clash. Um, so we, we deliver a, a new feature to a client, and they've already built something that has the same classes uh, named in the global namespace that they would end up clashing and it'd be a pain to fix. So we went for a, a a fully qualified Java name style, in essence. Uh, you, can, you can actually write Java like this, uh, well, somewhat like this. Uh, no one would actually do that, though. And along with the code style, we also took the packages and directory style, so it's the same thing, source, Kaplan grid, so on and so forth. Again, it's overkill compared to what you would see nowadays in modern JavaScript applications. So this, uh, you know, when you're, it's not feasible for us to have a thousand script tags uh, and manually uh, loading classes. Some of these classes were extending each other. So for example, we're implementing interfaces or extending classes. We have to have a specific ordering. And we couldn't really have uh, a thousand classes 
a script tags being loaded in. So we created our own custom loader. This is something like um, Browserify or Webpack, but many, many years ago, well before Browserify or Webpack existed. Um, it would just scan the source code, look for strings that matched files on the, on the directories, in the directories, and it would load those files in, into your bundle. And if that file was referenced inside an extend or an implement uh, call, it would load that file before the class that is referencing it, if that makes sense, to make certain that the JavaScript is in the correct order. Um, not, that, not that important, but basically it worked. Uh, at that point, it was all good, it was great. You could load <coughs> massive code bases, uh, F5, no build, uh, live development, and it was, it was great. Thing is, things, things improved in the JavaScript landscape. The community came up with solutions to the problems that we struggled with years before, and their solutions were not like ours. Um, they, came up, they borrowed the concept of modules from other languages, like Modula, instead of packages namespaces from Java. These, uh, these concepts, these uh, ideas, AMD, CommonJS, and ended up influencing the ES6 module spec. So this meant that the future of the language was moving to modules. Uh, that meant our code base was basically a walking dinosaur. But not only that, it also resulted, modules resulted in more readable code base and more analyzable code base, statically analyzable code base. Um, because you're no longer necessarily referencing everything from the global name space, you're actually importing and explicitly declaring your dependencies, as opposed to magically having them in your bundle. So we decided that we were going to add support for CommonJS. Uh, the idea was all new code is going to be in CommonJS, all old code is going to be old code, uh, and stay as it is. I didn't particularly uh, like that, and not a lot of us did. I mean, the old code is extremely difficult to read and very annoying. It would often scroll off to the side hundreds of lines long because we might have very deep hierarchies uh, of, of packages. So it also wasn't quite, it wouldn't fit in the same way as mo with modules very easily. Quite often with modules, you would, you, would not, you would not export classes like classic Java code. You would export functions and functions would not be attached to anything in the module. They'd be the top level export of the module. So you'd have to have these, if you wanted to start programming in that fashion, which is a different fashion, you'd have to create the object literal to the object expression namespace to, ha to attach the function onto. So it was an incredibly weird way of, of functional programming in, in JavaScript. So the idea was, could we convert all this old code uh, and just drop namespace? I, I thought about it for some time. Uh, these are the only approaches I could come up with uh, doing it manually, regular expressions, find and replace, or parse and mutate the code. Um, now, for us, the first three really weren't going to work. Um, now, I've crossed them out, but I'm not saying that they never make sense. It depends on your context. Our context was that we had four or five applications of 1,000 plus classes. Our clients took those, we had multiple investment banks, tens, they built their own code and they could end up with hundreds of classes of their own. There is no way we can ask anyone to do this by hand. Human beings get bored doing the, the same work over and over again, they will end up adding errors. Uh, regular expressions and find replace were never gonna be flexible enough. So the only option was to parse and mutate the code. So what do you need to parse and mutate the code? Um, oh, actually, sorry. Uh, to remember, to, as, a, as a reminder what, what we wanted to achieve, um, we wanted to convert this kind of code into this, a lot more readable. Uh, I know the module IDs don't really make sense, they're not what you would, you would expect, that is because we're not actually using Webpack or Browserify, we're using our own tool. So, you know, we, we kept the namespacing uh, package approach from Java, but uh, we're hopefully gonna integrate NPM in soon. Um, but for the most part, the code is much more readable. So, what you need to do that? You need, well, firstly, of course, a parser. Um, and you, the two major parsers back when I first started working on this were Esprim and Acorn. They've now been joined with, uh, by Esprit and Babylon, which are basically forks of the top two ones. Um, Esprim and Acorn, Esprit are all 
are putting ES3 compliant ES3 ASTs. Um, I'll explain what they are in a second. But Babylon at the moment does that. Babylon is Babel's parser. Now, Sebastian McKenzie has said that he will probably uh, deviate from the spec uh, if it suits his purposes for Babel's purposes. So it might no longer be compliant in a few years' time, so be careful. But the thing is, Babylon will more than likely be uh, better at handling future syntax uh, in the language. The reason why, for instance, Esprit was created, that is a fork by the ESLint project, was because Esprima refused to add ES6 features until they were fully uh, certified and shipped. And people wanted to use ES6 years before then. Anyway, uh, all these parsers um, output ES3 compliant AST at the moment. The ES3 is basically Spider Monkeys, uh, Mozilla's Firefox, JS Engine, uh, <coughs> AST. The APIs are all pretty much similar. You give them a, a string of text and a few options and it returns an AST. Now, what is an AST? An AST is an abstract syntax tree. It's basically a representation of your code with, that only contains the semantically useful or valuable information of your code. So it doesn't, for example, uh, contain uh, line breaks or uh, spacing or where your brackets are, for example. If you want that kind of information, you want a con uh, concrete syntax tree. Uh, I'm not aware of any context, uh, concrete syntax tree parser for JavaScript. So, yeah, so in essence, what it does is it translates code like that, my long namespace field, and it creates a tree data structure, which looks like this. Uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna create a diagram, but I didn't have time. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it's a tree where you can see the two leaves are, at, for the root of the tree, is our property and object. And um, you can see that object uh, branch has further uh, children and uh, leaves. So the actual tree is made up of AST nodes, and each of the nodes has a type. Uh, as you can, you can see, it's the, uh, the two types here are identifier, so at the very bottom it says property type identifier, and the other one is member expression, which contains identifiers. Um, the ES3 spec fully specifies all the properties that these node types have. You can read it online. And also, I would suggest looking, if you're interested in seeing what your code looks like in AST form, astexplorer.net, the bottom link is a fantastic tool for visualizing your code in an AST form. Um, this spiel here at the, at the top of the slide is um, the spec, the ES3 spec. So if, you're, if you want to know what properties a node can possibly have, you will just read the spec and it will tell you. Uh, identifier is very simple. A lot of other node types are, much, are far more complicated or, or a bit more complicated. So to transform the ASTs, I chose Recast. I, I am, before even talking about the code, I know that there are other tools out there. Um, I, I mentioned them later on. But uh, at the time I was doing this, this was uh, really about the only option out there. It's created by an ex uh, Facebook programmer. Um, Facebook do a lot of this large-scale code transformation. Um, and the API, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, it provides a parse, types, and print exports. It provides other exports. So you give it your source code to ask it to parse it. It's actually using a fork of Supreme at the moment. It might move um, to uh, using Babylon, possibly in the future. We'll see. Um, it also um, has a grab bag of factory functions that allow you to create new node types. So the third line, the module identifier line, is creating an identifier node. And you might think, why do I need that when identifier is basically two properties? It's so simple. Well, the thing is, not all node types are that simple, A, and B, it can be handy for spotting errors if you are not providing all the options that are required for a valid node type. And also, it provides default values if you're not interested in filling out all the values. Now, you can modify the AST by directly mutating the actual uh, tree itself, as, it's, as it, the, la the, the uh, fourth line is doing, where I'm basically going into the expression, replacing it with the identifier. So it will, when you print it, Recast also provides printing support. The printer is um, smart enough to not change your code, even the white spaces, as much as it can, except for the parts you've mutated. That way, it means, makes the diffs much easier to uh, compare with each other. 
So it won't just go willy-nilly nuking the, the styles of your code. It'll try and persist them as much as it can. Uh, so basically what we're doing there is we're modifying my long namespace field to just be field, in essence. Um, so if you're wondering about the program.body part, the actual tree that I showed earlier was a bit of a lie. The real tree in a, in a full JavaScript file is going to have uh, a few more nodes at the top level, the program node type, and the program node type has a body property with an array of all the top level expressions or statements. Okay? So your, your file, when you open it, it's basically a big array of node types. And that stuff I just ignore because there was no way it was going to fit into the slide. So that's what's going on. It's just skipping along to those uh, lower level nodes. Um, so this isn't really a very scalable way of doing things. You can't just sort of fumble around in the tree trying to figure out where tree, uh, nodes are and mutating them like this. What you really want is uh, a way of traversing the, the tree. No, well, I mean, almost all tools use uh, a visitor pattern. Um, it's like Computer Science 101, so it'll be the similar in, in Babel or any other, or, other tool you can use. Um, what you do is you pass in the, uh, your visitor to the visit export from Recast and the AST, and it'll call you back with all the node types as it finds them. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. So zooming into one of those uh, identifier visitor, visitor callbacks, um, what happens is Recast doesn't actually provide the node itself to the, to the visitor because the node itself is contextless. It has very little useful information. For example, the, the node itself has no reference to its parent. And very often when you're mutating the code, you want to reference the parent to verify that what you're mutating is actually uh, structurally as you believe it is or in the context that you believe it is in. So what Recast actually does is it provides you a, its own, its own uh, abstraction called a notepad. And notepad uh, gives you a whole bunch of useful, uh, useful functionality like uh, how to mutate the tree itself. So it provides you a replace method. You can see that at the end of the actual um, the if statement. It allows you to replace nodes safely, uh, prune them. Uh, if, there's, if you're removing nodes and there are no more nodes in a variable declaration, for example, like var x1, comma, y2, you remove x and y. You don't want the var just to be left on its own, so you use prune. Um, and it, it provides scope information quite often. It's very important when you're mutating code. You want to make certain that if you're creating a new identifier, like we are in this code, uh, we're creating the identifier that's the name of the class. We want to make certain that identifier doesn't already exist in the code because you're mutating my dot namespace field to field, but field might already exist somewhere in the global namespace or in the code itself. So you want to verify it doesn't exist, and if it does, you want to create a unique uh, ID so it doesn't clash. Um, so that's uh, not the only way to mutate um, an AST. I, once I've I had written a few transforms, I actually um, came, created a, a somewhat more easy to parse API, which it consists of matchers and transforms. So a matcher, in essence, specifies the kind of code idioms you're searching for in the AST, and the transform will then be provided the, the nodes that you found and will mutate them. So for example, the top matcher is going to search for an identifier called Kaplan. Its parent should be either a member expression with the property that has an identifier of extend or uh, a member expression with the property that has an identifier of implement and it should be a call expression. So in the comment you can see it, it looks for Kaplan.extend or Kaplan.implement as calls. It's somewhat more readable than doing it imperatively, I hope. Although most of you are looking at me as if to say, what? I don't have a clue what you mean by readable. Um, and uh, the transformer is fairly similar to that. Um, it, it will replace it with, a, with an another different type of uh, code structure. Um, we also upgraded our uh, inheritance libraries at the same time, so this is part of that code. So you don't want to perform large-scale complex transforms uh, in one visitor. It's a really, really bad idea. It's very complex, very difficult. You might end up introducing bugs with uh, changes uh, clashing with each other. 
So uh, my suggestion is to use multiple transforms. This is a part of the code from the tool. Um, it's using node streams. Um, hopefully it's straightforward enough. You're just streaming through all the transforms, the AST. Um, and the different transforms there are, are specified. No need to go too far into it. Um, so the other, another tip, if you want to do something like this, is to make your transforms configurable. Usually it's a really bad idea to hard code information in them. Um, so this is an export for a visitor. And every single file that the tool would find, it would pass in the namespace for the class. And the visitor will then set up the class name for the class and will know what set of member expressions to look for inside this next AST that's going to be provided, that's going to visit over. So you, you might think, oh, wow, this is like a lot. I know it's a lot of code. I've flown through quite quickly. Um, uh, and you might think, this is a bit overkill. Is there not like an easier way of doing something? I just want to make a small change to my code. This is a very complex. And you're in luck. There is actually a very nice tool, which I'd actually suggest for most cases, probably this makes a lot more sense than building your own tool. Um, I built my own tool partly because I didn't even know this existed, or maybe it didn't exist at the time. It wasn't open source, it's a Facebook tool. Um, and also because the actual use case is quite complex. There's a lot of transforms going on. And this is really good for one-off standalone transforms. So you uh, basically tell it where your transform is. You don't have to. It has defaults for all of these. You tell it where your source files are, and it's going to run your transform over all those source files. Um, this is an example of the, the transform. It's a very simple one. What this tool actually does is it wraps recast. Uh, so it wraps the library that I was talking about two seconds ago. Um, but it, prov it, it provides a nice jQuery-like API. So it's, it's fluent. It'll, it'll find, for example, in this case, all the variable declarators, all the variables called flu, rename it to bar, and it'll return that source code. Much more, I hope, much more readable than the imperative approach. Um, but at the same time, it provides access to recast, and you can build nodes with the factory functions. It's quite powerful. You can run, you can do dry runs before modifying any of the code. So it can tell you, oh, I mod I've modified 10 out of 15 files. Uh, it, you can also, also gather stats on the code. So you can also run it on your code base, and it'll tell you, oh, you have this idiom that you want to transform 1,675 times in your code base can be useful. Uh, it also supports template literals. I'll uh, show a code snippet uh, in the next slide as to what that means. It's quite cool. It might be, a, again, an easier way to transform code for people. There's a, a GitHub repo called JS Codemon, which has a bunch of sample transforms that you can take a look at if you're interested in. I would suggest this tool for most cases. Most times, it probably makes sense to use something like this. Um, so this, uh, these are quick examples of the API. So the first example is just looking for all identifiers. You, you, you pass it in a string, your file. Uh, that's provided to you by uh, JS Code Shift. It provides you a, load of, a lot of information. It's really good. It's quite, it's quite a good tool. Uh, and then you can iterate all over all the identifiers. So JS Code Shift, um, it's, it's kind of, um, its core concept is collections. So you find a collection of different kind of nodes. Um, and uh, you literate on the, on the collection and either modify it or do something with it, or something else with it. The second example is how to use template literals. I, again, I don't know if, if it's too readable, but I'd say the thing to focus on is the replace wit callback. You're using a, uh, I presume most people are familiar with your six template literals. Um, you're, it's kind of like string interpolation um, uh, for the language. So statements is actually a function and um, what happens is you can convert the code, the for statement, you, you're finding all for statements, and you're converting them to using a while uh, loop. So any for statement it finds, it returns a node in the callback, and you can use, uh, so that's node, and you can basically say it return, replace any for statements with this string that's returned by the statements uh, template tag. Um, and yeah, and you, can put, and you can pass in CLI options on the command line, so it's, a really nice tool. I imagine most people are probably familiar with uh, Babel plugins, uh, Babel uh, plugins. I 
don't know if it makes sense for a use case where you're just going to transform your code and then never use a transform again. Uh, there's somewhat more ceremony to a ba uh, Babel plugin than there will be for a JS code shift uh, transform. So it might not m make that much sense. But if you, if you have Babel in your, in your build pipeline and you have some cases where you want to run something when you're, for example, going to production and you want to replace node M variables or something like that, uh, it's, it's quite useful. Or remove asserts. So for example, during, production, during development, you might want to have a, a lot of asserts in your code base to verify that e everything is, is correct, the, the types being passed into all your functions are correct, but you don't want to ship that to production, so you could use Babel to strip those out. Um, the concepts in it are fairly similar. It has a types, T the first line. T is basically, uh, again, a grab bag of factory functions, just like recast, that allows you to create node, that allows you to create node types. Um, it has a very nice API for replacing multiple nodes, which can be uh, fraught with danger, um, where you might be replacing uh, uh, statements where there might be expect, um, expressions expected instead in JavaScript, for valid JavaScript. It will deal with all these complexities for you. Uh, you can use source strings, so you don't even have to build the AST. You can just say, when you find something that matches this, replace it with this string. So super easy. Um, and yeah, it's very easy to rename bindings. And it has all the, um, uh, the, the, the features you need to safely create new variables, which is of course very important for Babel because it's converting people's random code, which they might have all sorts of variables in it. So they can't just create new variables that will clash with other people's variables. So all that kind of functionality is built into Babel. Um, and it's quite handy. So, you might be thinking, um, firstly, that's a lot of code. Uh, that was a bit too much, maybe. But um, it's also very, maybe that's not really what I want. I have a, a simpler use case. Um, you know, I might just want to implement, I want to enforce this, I want to fix a legacy code base that doesn't match my, code, my style guide. Or I want to fix ESLint linter rules uh, and like, you know, double quotes or quoted properties or whatever it might be or new lines at the end of your file. Like you might have a legacy code base, you might want to bring up scratch, but you can't because you have hundreds of files and it's going to take you ages and there's no way you can justify that. Well, Recast kind of have its output configured, the, the, pr uh, the printer function that prints out the AST, but it's not very flexible. That's not really what it's designed for. As I said, it's mainly designed to keep the code as similar as possible so that the diffs are easy to read for you. There is another tool that I would suggest and that I use to achieve this, uh, and that's ES Formatter. There are other tools available, but they're not, I, I don't think they're quite as good. Just Beautifier is another one that's not really as feature packed. Um, and uh, there's another one that I can't remember. That's uh, Code Painter. That seems to be has, has seems to have been abandoned. <clears throat> it's by out of the box. It's extremely. It allows you to configure all settings for indentation, white space, and um, one other thing which I can't remember because I didn't put it on the slide. I put it in my speed cards, <laughs> which I can't see. Um, so it's extremely configurable for those uh, uh, values out of the box. If you want to change something that ES Formatter doesn't come with by default as a, as a knob to, to turn, you can create a plugin. As these are some of the plugins, some of these are, I have written myself, some of these I haven't, uh, I actually think two of them. So for example, there's an ESLint rule to say you want a space between uh, your comment and the comment slashes. It's a, bit, it's a minor rule, you're not gonna spend a lot of time fixing this in your code base, if you have a lot of code base, if you have a large code base, that has hundreds of errors with this. But with ES Formatter, bam, write a plugin, super simple, everything's fixed. Same thing with quote props, uh, that's an ESLint rule. Uh, and quotes and so on and so forth. So you can enforce your, your indentation uh, style guide settings. The uh, plugins, the API for the plugins is fairly anemic, but it does the job you're not going to be, you shouldn't be using. If you find the API that it's not quite up to scratch, it's not powerful enough, you probably want to go back to recast or uh, JS code shift, which is basically recast, okay? ES formatter is for a different use case. It's purely for making certain your code looks a certain style. It's more about the concrete than the abstract syntax tree part. Um, you do, you are provided with, to uh, with nodes, but as you can see, the callbacks are nowhere near as powerful as visitors. 
uh, where you can specify exactly the node types and so on and so forth. Um, you would, I would not suggest using this for what you should use recast for. The, imp the code at the very bottom is actually the complete implementation of the spaceline ESLint uh, rule fixing plugin. So it's incredibly simple. Uh, you check that a token type is a line comment. If it doesn't start with space, add space to the, to the raw value of the token. Extremely simple. And that's it. It fixes hundreds of, of problems in a very large code base immediately. It's very quick. Um, uh, the other uh, code snippet comes from the quoted property ESLint rule fixer, which is, again, another ESLint rule, which makes certain that uh, properties that shouldn't be quoted aren't quoted. It's all really minor stuff, and you can't justify spending a lot of time fixing these things. But if you can automate it, then it's, it's a trivial thing. It takes no time. Uh, and it's a, there's, a lar there's a long list of plugins on the ESFormatter GitHub repo that you can look at that will fix all sorts of things with, uh, with linting rules. <clears throat> right, so congratulations. You've now transformed your code base from crufty old code to modern code that follows your style guide and uh, has fixed thousands of, tens of thousands of ESLint errors. Um, Great, congratulations. So, fantastic work. Um, so really the take home message from this is that you, you quite often hear you know, discussions uh, with developers, you're going, oh, we can't change this API because, well, we have it in hundreds of places, it's not possible, our clients are using it. Forget it, you can. You can actually do this, just go ahead, wipe the transforms, do it. Um, Facebook do this with React, they have uh, React code transforms that will modify the APIs to, let's say, for example, from React trait class to the modern ES6 class syntax. So, and they do this large scale on their code base, thousands of classes. So you can actually contemplate large scale changes and you shouldn't be afraid of that. Okay, that's basically it. That's I hope you take from that, from this talk. Um, don't know if there's any questions. Like questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for talk, and it's a great job. But actually, what uh, what the reason to prepare all these tools in your company to use these tools in your company? Did you transform all your legacy code to the a new format like ECMAScript six? Uh, so we've trans <coughs> we have transformed a good chunk of it to CommonJS. Uh, some parts of it we can't because the oldest. Uh, we have to wait until like, we rev a major version. So it does work. We have transformed certain applications which our clients don't get the source code to. But some one application, uh, we actually gave our clients the source code access and they do three-way merges into the code. So we're planning to do it in a slower, it's a slower, more gradual uh, process. They can actually change the code we work on. Um, it was, this was years ago. We didn't realize the end effect uh, that I was going to end up having. It was a bad decision, but almost, all, all, almost everything else that uh, was namespace is now CommonJS. So, not totally. Did you have uh, tests for all the code? Right, so there are tests for most of the code. Um, for the most part, really the transforms are f before actually checking in, you do a diff and you make certain it all Sorry, makes. Sorry, up. Actually, a question: uh, How safe to transform? Because actually, on a small piece of code, it will <coughs> work fine. But uh, for uh, let's say for tens files, it could be some mistakes uh, because uh, no, uh, all uh, not all situation could be uh, d described in some transformation rules. Yes. And uh, uh, how many? Uh, yours after transformation did you face uh, in the uh, source code? Okay, so we have, it's only been about the end of last year that we had CommonJS support, so we've only had done this for about eight months or so, nine months. But so, firstly, uh, I would suggest what we do is we transform code bit by bit. So the first thing, let's say, is formatter. You're fixing all the linting rules, the, the those styling issues. You can do that on its own, separate. So do that, check the diff, check that in, run the build, everything's fine, that's fine, that's cool, that's one change done. Then later on you can go and you can actually, what our loader 
marks certain directories as common JS. So we can actually convert by directories. So we can do it in a gradual process. <clears throat> but for the most part, I just convert hundreds at a, at a go. The unit tests or loading up the application is usually good enough. Um, ESLint will catch any bad errors. There are very, very few of them because our code base is extremely highly structured. It follows uh, the name path uh, approach all over the place. Um, so it's, it's very rare that there's an actual issue. Usually it's, a, it's, a, it's an edge case in one or two classes at most. Um, we've been okay with that. But as I said, I would suggest maybe trying to perform the transforms bit by bit if you're worried. So for example, what you could do is you, you what we could do is instead of transforming all the code to flatten all the classes, we could transform all the classes to ifies, immediately, immediately invoked function expressions. So we can have the namespace part at the very top of the class. Uh, so my dot la long namespace class and put the class inside an iffy in it, uh, and a, a, a function expression and return the class at the, at the, at the bottom. So you uh, end up modifying, no, no wait, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be a very good idea actually. That wouldn't make any sense. It would still have to modify the, the methods. So I don't know, I mean, I would say what you can do, what we can do is because we have require in the global, we can actually, if we want to, uh, slowly convert all the code to use require. We have a, a style called faux common JS, where the code isn't actually common JS, but because require is in the global, we can actually use require up at the top of the class, and our tool will wraps all the code in function expressions, so that stuff doesn't leak into, those identifiers at the top don't leak into the global namespace. So each of, each of those, cla that class that you saw at the beginning, imagine that actually, the tool that bundles the code wraps it in a function expression, right? So it's not actually at the top level of the JavaScript code. Um, so the, very, the class at the start, that's not actually what you see in the source code. The tool takes that, reads it, and wraps it in, like Browserify, wraps it in a, in a header of a function and a tail of a function. So that whatever is inside that class doesn't actually leak out. It, it makes them into, in essence, little modules, even though they're still using the, the namespace verbose approach, approach of code, right? And then we also export everything to the global namespace that that class needs. There's a whole lot of magic there. But basically, because of that, we could piece by piece convert all the global references to requires at the top. In practice, though, because our code is so highly structured, it's not really been that big of a deal. I convert a library with 100 classes and have it done in a couple of hours. It just mostly works. Um, so not really needed to do that. Um, and how you test all functionality after transformation? Unit tests, ATs, QA, like it goes yes. through the full cycle. Um, we have a fairly customers. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, like if you actually do this, like our code base, because it's high, so highly structured, it's the diffs are like exactly the same. We're just cutting tough stuff at the top at the start of every identifier almost. It's a very simple diff uh, if you look at it. I mean, it's just saying my dot lang name space field is equals to field. That diff, you'll immediately see if there's anything wrong there. It'll catch your eyes. Uh, and you can just flick through them fairly quickly. And there's a whole, there's a bunch of other transforms that we do that m can cause more issues. Because this, this namespace style was very verbose, we would often use aliases. So we'd say var my class equals my long namespace my class. And we, I have a transform that goes and finds those aliases and expands them back out where my class is used. It probably doesn't make much sense, but. Basically, people were working around the fact we had to use these long namespaces because they're so ugly. Um, so you'd have a local reference in a function to the long namespace. If I had my keyboard, I could type code, but I don't trust this. Uh, like I don't, I can't even okay, thank get you. out of this uh, presentation mode. Any other questions? Hi, uh, thanks for that. Um, I just have a quick question in terms of like the legacy code that you were dealing with for, at the very, very start. So how forgiving uh, do, is the process for the leg in, in terms of the legacy code and dealing with the legacy code? 
Um, you've got different developers, how long ago, five, ten years ago, writing this code at different skill levels, different abilities, hacks, whatever, going into it. So does it allow for that kind of thing, or do you have to basically come back and say, no, well, we need to structure this properly, we need to do this properly, and then run it through your process? Uh, there's one thing that we have found that is a problem is tests. Because before everything was in the global namespace, people would write tests by stubbing out, like Ruby style, they'd stub out references to classes that were previously in the global namespace. Like they'd mock them out. So my.lang namespace, my method equals my test method. But now, because the module you're testing is a module and it's requiring that class at, at load up time, when you do that, when you stub out that global reference, you're no longer stubbing out the identifier that the module has captured. So in this code, for example, I can override uh, the set grid view method on my decorator there, okay, the, set, the, set, the, the first method. In a test, that's available in the global uh, scope. I can type it into console, uh, NovoX, FX Trader, grid decorator, my decorator, prototype, set grid view, it's there, okay? I can stub it in a test, run a unit test, and it'll call my stubbed set grid view. In a module, you're importing your identifier when the code is loaded. So when in the test, I stub out that method, I don't stub out that identifier, okay? Because the, we cache what's returned. What's actually provided in the global namespace is uh, another version of the actual code. It's a, it's a clone of this class. So it ends up causing problems for tests. But these are bad tests anyway for the most part. They're very rare and they fail very quickly and horribly. Um, so for the most part, it's not caused that much of an issue. Um, as for your first question, if you don't write your code in a style that follows this namespace pattern, your code won't be loaded. The tool doesn't understand, and the tool didn't understand anything other than this. So it's like writing common JS and putting in random module identifiers, the strings up at the top. Webpack's not going to understand that. Browserify's not going to understand that. Not going to be loaded. You've, you've no choice. You've got to follow the standard. It's the same thing with, with this code here. So in fact, <clears throat> we, didn't have, we don't have that, much, that many problems with that kind of code. Um, so I mean, and, and finding global identifiers in the code is very straightforward as well. jQuery, if you find it, you can just lift it to be a require in the module. Uh, so you can, you can test all identifiers. Is this a global identifier? Yes, because it's not defined anywhere in the class that you're testing, that you're visiting. Uh, the tools will give you this. They'll tell you, is this a global identifier? Because you're just referencing it uh, in the code, but you're not importing, you're not declaring it in the code. You're not saying var jQuery equals this. You're just saying jQuery, it exists. That's global, okay? And you can test that. And if it's one of those well-known globals, it just adds a, a require up at the top. So there's a specific transform that does just that, that looks for these globals. When it finds them, lifts them up to the top and, and adds requires. Uh, and then there's a transform that flattens the classes, the, the class under, under uh, transform, and then there's a transform that flattens the dependencies of the class. So those namespaces there in the methods, because they're not defined in this class. Um, anyway, waffling on for ages, really sorry. So. So we're going to wrap it up there. Um, thanks very much to Brian. Excellent talk. Excellent question.